I was born on a small farm in Nebraska, and my dad worked as a ranch hand, and my family lived in a small house on the ranch. Back then, I was considered a tomboy, and the outdoors was my playground. So if anybody wanted to find me, they knew where to look. I'd be in the barn playing with the baby pigs. <laughs> By the time I was in the first grade, I was stamped as stupid and put in the back of the classroom. But I wasn't stupid. I had a learning disability, but they didn't know about those back then. And it wasn't until I was in the seventh grade math class that I realized that if I worked very hard, I could get an A. And I did. And I did in every class after that, including college, where I graduated with one of the university's highest GPAs. My parents, they never led me to believe in limits. It was simple. If I wanted something, I was going to have to work for it. I knew the world was full of opportunities, and they weren't going to just drop into my lap. It was up to me to go after them. By 1994, I was happily married with a beautiful daughter and a graduate student at Cal State Fullerton. It's during this time I began to notice seemingly unrelated medical problems, things like distorted vision, blood in my urine, extreme fatigue, sinus problems, tingling in my hands and feet. So I started seeing many medical specialists, many medical tests. None of them could reveal the answer to these mystery symptoms. Thus began my 14-year journey for answers. One day I was working in the university exercise physiology lab when I, was, I felt like I was suddenly plugged into an electrical socket. Painful bolts of current shot through my body. I don't know how long it lasted. When it stopped, I, I was confused and completely exhausted. I told my doctor about this, and he mentioned something about multiple sclerosis. Well, that got my attention. I contacted a highly recommended neurologist and the first available appointment wasn't in four, until four months, but I took it. And after several visits and almost a year of testing, I was told, well, we don't know what's wrong with you. You're just going to have to wait till your symptoms get worse and come back. I was stunned. My brain tilted as I tried to comprehend the fact that she had just told me to go home and let whatever was going on in my body get worse, and then come back. It was at that point I realized that I had to become my own medical advocate. And I referred myself to another neurologist who did further testing and said, I don't know what's wrong with you, but I find no evidence of multiple sclerosis. This was both good and bad news. Over the years, the problem that I found most terrifying was my rapid loss of vision. So setting aside all my other medical conditions, I had to focus on saving my sight. I believe I can handle almost anything, but I was truly terrified of going blind. So over the next four years, I went from one eye doctor to another, each one telling me the same thing. I don't know what's wrong with you. Desperate to find an answer, I referred myself up to the Jules Stein Eye Institute at UCLA, where an amazing doctor worked tirelessly to save my deteriorating vision. He subsequently diagnosed me with retinal vasculitis and began treating my eyes. It was during that time that I saw a television program called Everest Beyond the Limit, and I became drawn to climb that mountain. But I was no mountaineer. So at the age of 48, I was about to begin a new adventure, mountain climbing. I contacted a very experienced high altitude guide, and we arranged for my first training climb, Mount Aconcagua in Argentina. We had six months to prepare. Then it happened. While out shopping, I was suddenly overcome with vertigo and realized that I was could see out of my left eye. A blood vessel had burst. Well, after they reviewed the test results, they said, we think something else is going on in your body. And that's when they referred me to a rheumatologist at uh, UCLA's medical center, where six weeks later, on August 1st, 2007, I was finally diagnosed. I have Wagner's granulomatosis, a rare, incurable, potentially fatal disease. And as 
Shocking as that was, it was a relief to finally know what I had. I began a medical treatment program that made me very sick, and I was now functionally blind in my left eye. But I continued training. I had a mountain to climb. <laughs> About two weeks later, I was walking with a bag in my hand, and my hand dropped the bag. I didn't drop it. My hand did. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. And the researcher and me started analyzing the phenomenon as it moved around my body till I came to my senses and went over to my husband and calmly said, you need to drive me to the hospital, I'm having strokes. Of course, this led to more medical tests and more doctor's visits, but I remained focused on my goal, which made my doctors very unhappy. <laughs> I assured them I would be responsible and that if anything happened, I would turn around and come home. I don't have a death wish. I am not a thrill seeker. I'm an adventurer. And the fact that I had this disease was just another variable I was going to have to deal with if I was going to follow my dreams. So six months later, we left for Argentina and climbed Mount Aconcagua. Unfortunately, at about 20,000 feet, we had to abort our summit attempt due to extremely high winds. On the way down, at somewhere around 19,000 feet, I fell and broke my leg. I still had to get off that mountain. So for the next five hours and 10 feet at a time, I worked my way back down to base camp where I was helivacked off the mountain. People asked me how I did that. And I said, well, you can sit down and die or you can get off the mountain, even if you have to crawl. Over the next seven months, I had a couple of surgeries, but I continued to train. I had a mountain to climb. For most people who attempt Mount Everest, they train for many, many years. But I didn't know how long I had, so if I was going to attempt that climb, I had to do it as quickly as possible. So with the love and support of my wonderful husband, we set aside everything else and focused all of our time and energy on my goal. I had to train by climbing as many mountains as quickly as I could. By this time, my symptoms had been stabilized by my medical treatment program. The medicine, however, suppresses my immune system, which increases my risk of infection. But if I stop taking my medicine, the disease continues to damage my body. There are 7,000 known rare diseases. Unfortunately, the people with these diseases go years, even lifetimes, undiagnosed because there is no specific system in place to lead them to the doctors and treatments that may be able to help. There are national health advocacy organizations out there who have developed programs. But even in this age of social media and networking, I went for 14 years until I finally stumbled on the, the fact that I was one of 30 million Americans who have a rare disease. After all the years of doctor's appointments, medical tests, and research, I was shocked to learn that the whole time there was an answer, just no conduit to lead me to it. I became obsessed with finding out what I could help do to fix this. I contacted the National Organization of Rare Disorders, NORD, and told them of my plan. I was going to, through the power of media, shine the light on myself and Nord, and try to help bridge this gap. I left for Kathmandu on April 1st, 2010, for the 68 days it takes to prepare for and climb the south side of Mount Everest. The fact that I had Wagoner's granulomatosis did not change my drive to live life to its fullest. The famous Hillary step and the summit within sight. All I had to do was get there, literally 10 feet at a time. On May 23, 2010, after 51 days of working my way up the mountain, I stood on the top of the world with the Nord banner and became the 40th American female to summit Mount Everest. <laughs> But the summit is only halfway. I still had to get down, and I knew most accidents happened on the descent. 
By the next day, we were back to Camp 2 at about 21,500 feet. And when I was taking off my gloves, I looked at my fingers and they looked a little black. And I thought, wow, the dye on my gloves must be rubbing off. And then I go, that's stupid. I've been wearing these gloves for six weeks. My fingers were turning black. By the evening, my cheeks were turning black and my fingers were on fire. And I knew within a few hours, we were gonna be descending through the deadly Kumbu ice fall. I didn't have any fingers, but it just didn't matter. I was gonna get off that mountain. Summoning Mount Everest achieved my goal of creating both national and international media coverage, but it wasn't enough. I began speaking on behalf of rare disease awareness to all types of organizations from medical to political, but it still wasn't enough. So I wrote and self-published my book, Reaching Beyond the Clouds from Undiagnosed to Climbing Mount Everest, but I still wasn't happy. I needed to do something extraordinary to bring rare disease out of the darkness and into the light. So once again, I am reaching for the unreachable to become the first female and second person to both summit Mount Everest and complete the Alaskan Iditarod dog sled race. <laughs> <laughs> Over 3,000 individuals have summited Mount Everest, while only 731 have completed the Iditarod. The Iditarod is a 1,000-mile race from Anchorage to Nome. Roughly 23 checkpoints are along the route. Each year, about 70 teams, comprised of one musher and 16 dogs, head into the Alaskan wilderness for the nine to 14 days this journey takes. Across mountain ranges, frozen rivers and lakes, and through some of the world's most beautiful yet extreme terrain. It is a no assist sport, no two-way communication devices are allowed. Mushing is a very physical sport. Mushers don't ride the sled, they drive the sled. Teams run day and night on run-rest cycles. While the dogs rest, the musher works preparing for the next run. So consequently, mushers get very little sleep, average one to three hours per day. During the race, the weather can change by the minute, but the race continues, so mushers must be prepared for all conditions. In 2011, I went to Alaska and began learning to run sled dogs. I immediately fell in love with the sport, the Alaskan people and culture, but most of all, I fell in love with the world's most amazing athletes, the dogs. On March 3, 2013, I started my first Iditarod. 20 miles out, I injured my leg and thought I would have to scratch at the very first checkpoint. After resting for a few hours, I felt a little better and decided to run to the next checkpoint. And in that way, I went from one checkpoint to the next until on the 10th day and 630 miles into the race, my condition had worsened and for the safety of my team, I scratched. When I got back to Anchorage, I was told my pelvis was broken in two places. <laughs> For personal, professional, and financial reasons, I was only supposed to get one chance to complete this race. But in March 1st, 2014, I started my second Iditarod. Unfortunately, this year, Mother Nature wasn't very kind and made for some extremely dangerous and difficult trail conditions. I injured my shoulder, and again, I had to scratch. I recently became the spokesperson for the newly created Cat My Lodge Alaska and Markall Foundation for Disease and Disability Awareness. The purpose of the foundation is to raise hope and awareness and to help individuals with physical and psychological challenges achieve their dreams. And it is with their support that I am now scheduled to run the 2015 <laughs> Iditarod. In yet another effort to raise rare disease awareness to new heights, my husband and I are producing a feature-length documentary film called Banner on the Moon. It has become my life's mission to help 
bridge the gap between not only the general public but the medical community in connecting them with the rare disease resources. People often ask me how I can do these things and quite honestly, I didn't know. Recently, I discovered that I had this power in me and it had always been there, instilled by the environment I grew up in, my never-ending curiosity and tenacity, but most of all, by my parents who never led me to believe in limits, even those overcome only 10 feet at a time. <laughs>